Welcome to In the Arena, a show where entrepreneurs and leaders take us behind the headlines and into the biggest crises of their careers and lives and how they made it to the other side. I'm Jesse Janae, a startup founder and your host. Today on In the Arena, we have the co-founder of Honey, Ryan Hudson. He takes us inside Honey's $4 billion acquisition by PayPal, including the harrowing experience of being caught in the middle of two battling tech giants, PayPal and Amazon, prior to the deal even closing. We'd always wondered how the tech giants would feel about Honey as they started to pay closer and closer attention to it. In that moment, when you realize that they may be thinking of M&A and that the price may be north of one and a half billion, you must be doing the math. Okay, I own X percent, that means tomorrow I can go from a $250,000 salary to taking home nine figures. Ryan is a very positive person who rarely does podcasts and even more rarely discusses the challenges he's faced. It's people like Ryan who kind of risk perpetuating the idea that rocket ship success can be easy for some people. That's why we're so excited to share this conversation, to get beyond Honey's eye-watering acquisition. We delve into the great personal risks and challenges he faced to stick with Honey for years of struggle before things actually clicked. We are the last button that people are clicking before they choose to buy anything online. Uh, if we can't figure out how to monetize that eventually and turn that into a business, I should go back to MIT. Fast forward another year, we haven't raised any money um, from any, literally anybody that wasn't my mom or George's mom. George is trying to raise money and like, oh, where's your co-founder? He's like, ah, uh, he's working for another company. We layered on another layer of toxic investor, <laughs> absolute pass. <laughs> I'm gonna probably break every taboo in the world here. I wanna get super personal and just talk about actual numbers. How much money did you have in your savings account when you walked away? And I've got the perfect co-host today for this conversation, Ryan Kaldbeck, a startup founder and CEO himself, who is also well known on tech Twitter for discussing founder mental health. All right, so uh, first, thank you, Ryan, for joining us today. Um, Ryan Kaldbeck and I are so excited to have you on the episode here with us. Glad to be here. <laughs> um, so one, I'm really excited because you don't actually do a lot of podcasts. Um, I'm really glad that you decided to join us. I don't know if it has anything to do with our personal relationship <laughs> because we do technically have two children together and one on the way. <laughs> uh, did that, that, that was a decision? factor in my decision. <laughs> Ryan, I thought it was just to meet me. That's what I thought it was. <laughs> I mean, I've loved your content on Twitter for years, so it's a pleasure <laughs> to meet you in person, too. <laughs> Good it to meet you, too. was more of that, to be honest. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, right. Let's be clear. Um, so uh, I'm going to jump in to your story, as I do, with, as we do with everyone, uh, to a moment that was pretty intense for you. You have a really incredible trajectory of growing honey for many years and ultimately selling it to PayPal for $4 billion, <laughs> uh, not too shabby. But in the midst of that deal, Amazon decided to post a banner on amazon.com, their core homepage, that uh, effectively accused honey of being malware and encourage people to uninstall it, like actually gave them an action item, like you should uninstall this. Uh, you know, that, I'm curious, just jumping us right into this moment, what, where you were in the deal cycle and also like bring us into the time and place if you can, like, do you remember the month and sort of what was going on at Honey and with the deal when a tech giant decides, hey, I'm gonna try to like, ruin your company. <laughs> sure. Yeah. No, I remember it uh, quite well. <laughs> um, so we had announced the deal that PayPal is going to acquire Honey November 20th of 2019. And uh, about one month later on the Thursday before Thanksgiving. So um, pretty much everything is code frozen, ready to, everybody's ready to go on vacation for the holidays. Um, and that Thursday evening, we started noticing unusual uninstall behavior, and we quickly traced it back to every page of Amazon.com for all of our users now displayed 
a yellow banner across the top saying that Honey was unsafe and recommending you uninstall it immediately. Um, so <laughs> and this that was is surprising. right before, effectively right before Black Friday. No, no, no. It was uh, right before Christmas. Oh, sorry. So right before Christmas. We, we'd sorry. made it through Black Friday. The deal was okay. announced. It had been uh, okay, about sorry. a month. We'd gone through all of the regulatory approvals that had already happened. We're gearing up to, to close sometime in the next couple of weeks. And one of the largest companies in the world um, decides to tell all of our users that <laughs> we're basically malware. Um, so, yeah, um, the I remember... We were in the office and quickly rallied the handful of people on the team that are capable of doing something about that as quickly as possible and making changes during. Who, who were like trying to leave for like Christmas break? Basically, oh, everybody's leaving for, for Christmas. And basically there's a Skunk Works team of a handful of engineers that have been around from the beginning that control the keys to our release process. And we, we rapidly scrambled to, to respond to that technically. Um, and figure out what they were doing and we, we learned that it was it was just for honey users so they made an update to amazon.com to try to detect if somebody had honey in, installed mm. and then display this banner mm. and um so our response was that we as a browser extension could see that they were putting this banner in in front of our users and so we just made that banner go away for our users um, and deployed a new <laughs> <laughs> a new release but uh, so it, that lasted for less than 24 hours before it had been deployed to our users. We had a patch and, um, yeah, some people in in the journalism world noticed, um, started writing some articles about it, how Amazon was um, telling our users that we were malware. And, of course, in the midst of potentially closing a large acquisition, uh, it was we, we let PayPal know that what was going on and why it was happening and what we were doing to, to mitigate it. Ryan, the, the word unsafe is a bit subjective. What I think the banner said is Honey's browser extension is a security risk. Mm. Honey tracks your private shopping behavior, collects data like your order history and items saved, and can read or change any of your data on any website you visit. Is that true? Or was it true? It uh, pieces of it are true, and they're true for every browser extension. Um, yep. The the humorous part for me that we couldn't really go out there and talk about is Amazon's own browser extension, which is installed also by millions and millions of users, um, participates in what I would ca categorize as far more aggressive behavior <laughs> on, yep. on those fronts. Um, and so we, from the beginning, had always taken a very user-centric approach to, to data and privacy. And um, to the extent that we didn't need data to power features, we, we never collected data. Even in the, in the initial days of the company, we didn't have a user login concept for two or three years after launch. Like we didn't have anybody's email. If, if we'd been mm -hmm. deleted from the Chrome store, we literally would have been vaporized immediately. And it was because at that point we didn't have a need for a user's email, so we didn't ask for it. And mm -hmm. it was only when we added our cashback loyalty program where we needed to start tracking an account and assigning uh, honey gold credit to people to, to cash out that we created optionally the ability to create an account. I could imagine a lot of founders in that moment would not have steered towards the engineering solution. They would have steered towards a marketing solution, mm -hmm. trying to broaden this and say, you guys do the same thing or everyone does the same thing or trying to talk about all the things you just said. Why did you choose to not go down that route? Uh, it wasn't like a PR issue. It was something that instead they didn't, they hadn't gone public and said, Hey, honey is malware. And it wasn't in the press that this was being communicated. It was being mm -hmm. communicated literally to all of our users during the last days of the shopping season, when you get something delivered by Amazon um, directly to them in their interface. And um, one of the benefits of having a browser extension is that you have the opportunity to also communicate in context to users as that message would be there or not. Um, and so we, we used the communication channel we had, which was the browser extension to suppress that message. And we then thought we could manage whatever uh, the press side of it was later. 
and telling our part of the story, which we ultimately did. And the interesting part through this deal process is, I don't know how much people know about um, deal closings and the process around selling a company, but we had announced that PayPal was going to acquire Honey in November. Um, the deal is not closed. There are very specific rules about what collaboration is or is not allowed to happen between the acquiring company and the acquired company in that window of time. Um, basically, you cannot start to operate as though the deal is closed, and there's a lot of limitations on what they can they PayPal was able to do for us or not, um, including telling us if they were getting cold feet on the deal closing and like we're, we're worried about it or what what was going to happen next. And so we were transparent with what was happening, um, but they were unable to provide any guidance on what they as our, our future bosses um, wanted to happen in that situation or anything. So we were doing a lot of autonomous decision-making against the backdrop of massive uncertainty on um, what happens when Amazon goes to war with PayPal and you're in the middle as potential collateral damage on that um, was very interesting backdrop for making those important decisions. I think in the time window that that banner was up, we lost probably 50 or 60,000 users to uninstall, um, which is pretty substantial. And what was the base? Uh, we had tens of millions of active users at that okay. point in time, but not all of them were visiting Amazon.com. So if that had stayed up and persisted for a longer period of time, I'm sure that number would have continued to go. And not everybody that uninstalled that day, uh, um, I mean, there's certainly brand reputational potential hit from that. So we, we were definitely concerned. We didn't know how concerned PayPal was or was not until after mm -hmm. the deal closed, which fortunately... Yep. I just feel like if you if you can rewind to, you know, one of what like it's a very intense personal process to be in an acquisition uh, flow, like and especially of that size. And so like you're dealing with this already really intense moment of your company, internal comms, people are like worried about their futures, like all excited or not all these things. And then in the middle this thing happens, like how much, if you can remember, how much of the time did you actually wonder like, wow, could this like ruin the deal? I mean, you, you've you personally seen many deals go, uh, you know, go the other way when new information pops up basically. Yeah, I, I wasn't sure how it would go. I think the part that gave us less uh, stress and more confidence through that period was the, uh, the business was doing great. So we weren't selling the company because we needed to sell the company. Uh, we were selling because we saw an opportunity to partner with a, a very interesting large player to accelerate the vision we had about helping um, people find interesting things to buy online. And so it was a strategic acquisition that was interesting to both us and PayPal for um, different reasons, but it wasn't. With, the company was profitable. It was rap rapidly growing. Um, if we had continued to build the company, I think we'd still be doing great. And so there wasn't an existential piece to it, which I think made it less scary. Um, but we'd always wondered how the tech giants would feel about Honey as they started to pay closer and closer attention to it. Um, Google was an interesting large player in that we built a huge audience on their platform uh, the Chrome extension store that they had potential to wipe us out overnight. Um, so that was not a, a unknown thing. And to the extent that we were increasingly tapping into retail advertising budget as our core revenue driver, um, we, there was an unknown of what would happen then. Um, we weren't going head to head with Amazon, but similarly, as you start getting into the realm of the tech giants, um, it's a, different game and it's part of the reason from a comms and business strategy we, we kept a pretty low profile relative to the size of the consumer audience that we had we weren't out there trying to get TechCrunch or business press to write articles about how great we were doing um, in part because we didn't want small competitors copying what we we're doing and in part because we didn't know how some of the larger companies would feel about it if they thought too hard about what we were doing yeah were there any debates ryan when this moment was happening, any debates between you and George, your co-founder, or other teammates who thought you should be taking a very different approach? 
Uh, actually, not really. I mean, we 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 understood the technical capabilities we had to to manage the the banner um, pretty directly, and so it was pretty like, how fast can we get this deployed, and what is the update cycle time um, before everybody is patched with the new version? That's not going to scare them into uninstalling. Um, so there wasn't much debate about that. I mean, George and I had had debates at various points leading up to the acquisition on if we should sell or just keep going because things are going great. And we had built effectively our dream job and we're enjoying every single day of that. So um, there's more conversations there, but in that moment, it was pretty clear what we needed to do and how quickly we needed to respond. And it didn't drag out for too long in Parks. We suppressed the message and then the deal actually closed uh, January 3rd, I believe, of 2020. So it was only a couple weeks between the time that Amazon had done this and when it actually closed. And all of the international regulatory agencies plus the deal that they weren't going to stop in for antitrust or any other reasons. And it was allowed to close. So um, we didn't have to sweat it for too long. And just to orient us in time, because you gave us the date. I mean, this is this is like the tail end of 2019. At the time, none of us knew except for how cool 2020 would look like writing out. We didn't know how insane 2020 would be. <laughs> there would be a global pandemic and all the offices would close and everything. And so like, I don't know, now looking back, orienting this, you closed a deal like just a few months literally before the world like ground to an almost halt. Um, I don't know, like obviously you then didn't have any perspective, but I'm curious whether there's any conversations between you and George or just stuff where like, did you feel that that was lucky? Like closing the deal in in that time frame, Like when you had a little, when you kind of realized the pandemic and stuff was crushing forward? Oh, or, or conversely, Ryan was it unlucky because e-commerce took yeah. off totally. at that point. Totally. Yeah, I, I think it was both. And then, it, I mean, it started off feeling like it was super lucky as we didn't know what was going to happen and everything kind of collapsed there. And it looked like just the world might seize up completely. Um, within a month or two, it became clear that a lot of the spending had shifted to e-commerce and everything skyrocketed, um, including PayPal stock price. And so that went for a good year of boom of like, oh, we probably could have gotten more if we waited. Um, like the market value today would be higher than it was. And then everything since then has kind of settled back to the other side. Um, I think for us, the decision to sell was less about timing the market as a macro cycle or anything there. Um, it was clear that people were paying attractive prices historically for, for companies and investing. Um, we actually, the acquisition process started as we were looking to raise another round of capital, not because we needed it, because we, we actually, I took all of the money that Honey ever raised is on the balance sheet when we sold the company. And we periodically raised money in part to finance the working capital of the company and also to get a new print on the equity. Um, so as we're hiring new employees, having an accurate reflection of what the market price of the stock that we're granting people was important. And so we raised money a few times for that motivation and we're kind of always out talking to investors. And that's actually how the investment came to, or the acquisition came to be is we had done a series D that uh, City Ventures had done as like really small dollars, but got a new mark on the stock and we we're doing, talking to people similar. Um, and we're talking to the PayPal Ventures team and it rapidly accelerated into acquisition talks. And oh, so we had no plans. Turning point. Try to give us the turning point of that though. Like there must be a moment where you're talking to PayPal Ventures, you're talking to many people, you mentioned City, uh, you're, and I, I do just want to pause and just reflect on like, just how, like how low key you are about insane success things <laughs> just just like i know you really well but like just even when you dropped it you're like you know george and i were just like you know not sure are we leaving a lot on the table when you're about to sell the company for four billion dollars like um i think that is both really cool and also very earned because the company is growing so fast but just as a host <laughs> just feel the need to reflect on like 
how that is just not like the typical story. And, and not, that's why we're going to force you to cover many of the other more difficult uh, points you go through to kind of get to this moment. But you also just nonchalantly covered like the conversation with PayPal go from PayPal ventures to more of acquisition talks. But but how? Like, you know, I've talked to many investors like it does. What, what does that pivot actually look like? When do you realize they, this huge tech giant is actually thinking of you, but more as the acquisition target, what changes? Like, when do you get that? Do different people get involved? Like yeah. tactically, yeah. how do you realize that's occurred? Well, so the interesting thing for me is it was, uh, it was out of nowhere. George and I, for whatever reason, handled fundraising um, based on whoever made first contact. <laughs> and so he talked to a set of people, I talked to a set of people and we both were fairly interchangeable in a lot of the roles. Um, but he, George, uh, was running product and he was uh, talking to PayPal in part about doing like payment financial products. And he was meeting with the ventures team with uh, another one of our <laughs> guys on the team. And they met with the ventures team. And then the follow up was all of a sudden there's 40 people online creators. I did have people and all the various pieces of the organization. And so mm -hmm. it accelerated really quickly to that. The funny part for me- Were you in that meeting too, Ryan? I was, but they didn't know that I was the co-founder. <laughs> they, they thought that uh, the, the other guy was uh, the co-founder with George. <laughs> what other guy? And so when, when you, jo go ahead. Yeah, so we, we had another uh, exec named Costas uh, with a fintech background. And so he had met with them, with George. And it wasn't until like a couple meetings in that they realized that I was the other co-founder. Can you put us in that in that moment, Ryan? You show up, you, George, uh, and the executives show up, and they bring 40 people into the room. Did yep. you know that there'd be 40 people in the room before you stepped step foot in? No. No, but okay. I've learned it's so, not uncommon to have 40 people on a meeting at PayPal, though. Yeah, uh, fair enough. Uh, but when that happens, at some point in that meeting, especially when people start to introduce themselves as being from Corp Dev, something yep. goes off in your head that they are thinking about M&A. Oh, yeah, for sure. Yeah, it was a, a okay. pretty obvious and, immediately. And in that moment, you probably don't have a number of $4 billion in your head, but you probably have a number north of a billion, and I, you know, based on the revenue or whatever. Yeah, uh, right. we, we were talking okay. to investors. We had term sheets in the one and a half to two and change kind of range for an investment. Um, some of those were hairier than we'd want to do structurally, but we had a sense for yep. the market rate for a growth investment for what, where we were at is probably a one and a half to two. You come across as a very level-headed, clear thinker, calm. Yep. In that moment, when you realize that they may be thinking of M&A, and that the price may be north of one and a half billion. You must be doing the math for yourself. You must be doing like, okay, I own X percent. That means tomorrow I can go from a $250,000 salary to taking home nine figures. Yeah, right? I guess. I, I guess. Um, things were going great. I guess it's the backdrop on it where um, – so, so yes – but also um, I basically built my dream job working with an amazing set of people every day um, on a schedule that was flexible. Like I roll into work at 10 o'clock, sleep in, I go to the gym, you know, things like that. Um, and having the time of our life building this company with and massively profitable. Um, I guess the context is when we built a, pitch deck for what we thought might be possible with the company in February 2015. Um, I dug this up not too long ago just to like make sure my memory was accurate on it. But we made a hockey stick graph like every startup ever does <laughs> for the five-year projections on what we think we're going to do with this fundraise. And like the story was what we did. Um, and the craziest part of it all is the year five, 2019 revenue, um, we ended up, uh, we were off by 5 million on, it was like in nine figures in revenue. You actually hit your hockey stick. We hit like... the hockey stick. 
the first part wow. of it was ex- accelerated about a year faster than the first part of that, the first three years. And and when we made that graph, we had zero dollars in revenue. Um, and so things were going so almost objectively insane. So what you're almost communicating is like possibly is there some part of you actually when you're in that meeting kind of basically thinking I don't want to deal like I mean yeah, that's we, sort of what you're we, we we didn't want to sell I mean yeah. like yeah. so there's two the two parts that we didn't want to sell is one we knew that we had this incredibly valuable company that was growing company internal co- and profitably like everything about it was in great shape we knew that we could take as much cash off the table as we wanted at a reasonably insane price, like historically insane, insane price and de-risk it to the amount that mattered personally for George and I. Um, So there wasn't like a, Oh, this is the only option. And so the part that made it less like we thought we'd sell the company is one. We liked running the business, but the second part was, I didn't think that another company would understand the value that was flexible. So that was interesting. Mm-hmm. To you thought sell. it was unlikely. You thought it was yeah. unlikely. I'm like, yeah. It, it, which is what I ultimately told the head of corp dev in the conversation about price. And like, Jeremy, I don't think you can pay what <laughs> the number is that would take to get this done. Okay. We need to pause. We need to pause there because please break down I want to know, and uh, I want to know what is it like to negotiate a deal like this, and how, and how much is handled by you and George first teams of people just pouring over models and things like that. Because ultimately, we just admitted is like there's a number that you and George kind of have in your brain, and you what you just said is like you feel like it's just a number that someone won't pay, and therefore deal is unlikely. But somehow it goes from that to you getting a number that is like, you guys are like, okay. <laughs> and so yeah. bring us through that. Like, how does it happen? And how much is you to talking to whom versus teams of people doing stuff? Yeah. I, I mean, at, at the core, it was, we didn't want or need to sell. And so negotiating from a position of so like your best, best alternative is like, we don't do anything is, the ultimate leverage to have um and then the other half is that truly was the position it wasn't posturing or anything like that and um i honestly say, would say that there wasn't a number for george or i that were like hey this is the number and if we hit this number then like, we'll sell the company um it was the fact that paypal ultimately we got them to a number that communicated enough understanding of the value of what we had built and the potential for it that we believed that they would be committed to seeing through the rest of the vision and so um at a certain price they're as committed to making this work as we wanted to be and so that combined with assurances about how the business would operate and how we'd have flexibility to to continue to, to grow the business and run our teams um, was the piece that tipped it over more so than any number. Um, cause at some point the numbers are pretty insane, no matter what, and arbitrary. Were there debates with the investors, the investors, you know, wanted to sell earlier, later, anything. This sounds Ryan, if I'm uh, someone listening to this right now, I'm thinking to myself, this is the smoothest exit in history. There's not a single debate. They weren't looking for it. They got $4 billion dropped on their lap. Make us and I have a feeling. You, Brian. Make us believe you. I have a feeling. We, 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 <laughs> we threw a price up on Zillow, make me move, and uh, they came along. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, explain your board so, structure, maybe, but answer the question. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so Jesse knows a bit more. So because, so for, let's rewind. The company, we, we launched the product in 2012, and it was immediately interesting from a consumer point of view. We had like organic growth and over the next year and a half, we grew it to a couple hundred thousand active users, purely word of mouth with a handful of small press hits. No, did not raise any money. We uh, went up to Silicon Valley and tried to raise money a number of times and 
nobody wanted to invest in a browser extension on the desktop when all of the trends were around mobile. Like, what's mm-hmm. the mobile strategy? What's your app strategy? Oh, you have no revenue, and maybe you'll monetize through affiliate marketing, which is like toxic for PCs, especially then. And you have a browser extension that is like a toolbar. This is like only been used by criminals to do malware or sorts of things in the past. And so it was like mm-hmm. three for three toxic from an investment point of view. And so we couldn't raise any money. I personally got to zero and had to stop doing honey full time and go back and take a job as a product manager at another tech company for a year. While we need we... to pause here because this is the first piece of bad news you've shared. <laughs> this is... <laughs> We're finally getting to a place where, like, you, so you mentioned you had high organic user growth at the beginning, which is really, really cool. But most pivotally, you the company saw zero revenue and then has all these attributes that investors find very unattractive to the point where you can't raise money at all. And you actually have to leave the company for a little while. At, at is- all, at all. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. Like, we had a product where, as we were first started growing, um, that my background is I'm like a self-taught engineer um, for programming and I have an MBA from um, MIT. And so George and I would go into these investor meetings and George is a biology major um, who grew up in China until he was 10. And so we'd walk into these meetings and everybody assumed that George was the programmer because he's the Chinese guy and I'm the white MBA guy. And when they learned that I wrote the code, they're like, uh, this meeting's over. <laughs> <laughs> like, we were the opposite of what the pattern matching for what successful founding team. Ryan, like. that must have that must have shaken your confidence a little bit. You go up to Silicon Valley, you're pitching 50 VC. How many how many VCs did you pitch that turned you down? Yeah, something like that. Like 50, plenty. We went we went back, so we yeah. were Every based in LA. Every all all of them, yeah. We we drove up to Silicon Valley. Um, it was still like Sand Hill Road era of investors. They hadn't moved up to San Francisco yet, and we met with as many people as would meet with us for six weeks in a row. Every week we dr- did that drive through Central Valley of California, past the smelly cows, and <laughs> you must that up. must have shaken your confidence. Oh yeah, um, but at the same time, like on the user side, we we saw the potential. Uh, like as I described to some people at the time, and then did have moments of like, oh wow, um, I, it's like we are the last button that people are clicking before they choose to buy anything online. Uh, if we can't figure out how to monetize that eventually and turn that into a business, I should go back to MIT and tell them I don't know what the fuck I'm doing. Um, <laughs> and so I said that to people in let's say early 2013. <laughs> Fast forward another year, we haven't raised any money um, from any literally anybody that wasn't my mom or George's mom had put money into the company for the first year and a half. And yes, uh, confidence was shaken. It was uh, not not a fun time. And can, can you can you pause there and just talk about that time? Like your relationship with George, your confidence is, is hurting. Are you guys debating, fighting? You have different viewpoints. Were there moments where you know, the stress was boiling over? There was like a couple moments that never fully made it to um, a real decision point, but around let's just sell this thing to anybody. Let's take uh, any offer is better than like this thing appears to be worth zero. Nobody will fund it. We can't like generate any revenue off of it. And um, there was one company in the affiliate marketing space that we talked to that lowballed us and then like we're like oh we had a lot of conversation hard thinking back and forth on it in the four to five million dollar range for me that would have been life-changing um for george yeah right. I, just to be clear for, like for the whole for the whole company yeah not yeah. Not, not as an investment as like hey we'll buy this from you yeah uh and then um george had told a couple of companies they'd done earlier enough where he was comfortable beyond that um, being interesting. So we had like a divergence of what our number that would be interesting was. Um, ultimately, we were on board to sell it, and then they lowballed it even more. <laughs> it was like, oh, so that's not really, that's not really. You like the reached offer. bottom, and you were like willing to take the deal, and then they were like, 
Never They're like, actually, it's less. really more like two or three, and that's really just your salary for the next mm. <laughs> five years or yeah. something absurd. Um, and so we didn't do that, obviously. Um, we had a couple investor opportunities where they wanted to do, um, I would call it shady sorts of things with the with the, the extension. Um, mm-hmm. And we we turned down those in a similar time frame of like this thing was probably worth zero, but we're not going to sell it to somebody that's going to do illegal or shady yeah. stuff with it. Yeah. Um, and even in that moment, so this is where we got a lot of clarity on like the data collection and privacy and like how to think about that. It was like even when it's probably an L zero on the scoreboard, we're like it's it's not worth it to give it to somebody else that'll mess it up. So, and I've actually those... rarely, I've rarely heard stories about where if one of the co-founders actually has to step away more fully and take a job, and then comes back and is it like a full co-founder that is just as much part of the story as the other one. Like that, that that's pretty rare. So I don't know if it speaks to the strength of your relationship with George or your early contributions or like how you would break that down for a casual onlooker. But one, like maybe just explain that, like how long were you gone? A little bit more of the personal circumstance that must've been stressful because it was completely by need, not by desire. Yeah, it was, it was by need. But then um, if we were unable to raise money, can you imagine then George is, trying to raise money and like oh where's your co-founder he's like uh he's working for another company so like we were over three before and then we layered on another layer of toxic investor <laughs> absolute pass <laughs> like your other co-founder is not in <laughs> it's like, I'm like all right and, and then we've been around so long that like it starts to look just stale like everybody passed on it because they did um and so it was it was in a terrible spot as a, a business i think for me I, I don't have george's full experience of it but um working at the other job as a product manager is objectively the best job that somebody would have hired me to do um with that skill set and that time and i hated it because I didn't have the passion for it. And it gave me a lot of clarity that I needed to be an entrepreneur. Um, And through that period of time, George was scrapping around with basically a combination of volunteer and the cheapest people we could find to work on building stuff at a a garage in what I call the auto body district of uh, (laughs) Pasadena. (laughs) It's like, if you want to get your oil changed during work, we got the office for you. Ryan, we alluded to it before. You stepped away because of financial reasons. Is that right? Yeah. Can yeah, you go I, into more detail? Yeah. So I'd uh, prior to working on Honey, had spent uh, over a year um, working on other projects that also didn't work out and were unable to raise money for. I know it's it's harder to imagine now because there's been a lot of seed money available, pre-seed money for everybody for mm-hmm. the last five plus years it's been pretty flush um but there just weren't a lot of people especially in la um writing checks to pre like i don't know early early stage companies and and so yeah we we didn't have the resources so i'd burn through my personal savings like literally i had a bank account you know how much you spend every month and it's here's here's the day that it hits zero and I took a job um, at OpenX, um, an ad tech company, like six weeks before the zero line and worked that to, to pay the bills. And then sometimes I'd run over to the, uh, the Pasadena auto body shop <laughs> after work and, and work with George and the guys later into the night. So I wasn't not involved through that period. I just uh, needed to supplement my non-existent income Mm -hmm. and then uh ultimately i guess i reached the point where i knew that i had to do it and quit the job at openx um in january of 2020 or 2015 and uh that's why i was talking about the deck from february 2015 it's like an interesting one for me this is like i decided you know what i have to see this through one way or the other um 
full time, no more excuses. Um, George had somehow managed to piece together pieces of a small seed round. So we'd, we'd basically raised approaching the million dollars and had a, a small team. Um, and it decided it was more efficient and more important to pay other people. Um, but I was able to jump in full time again in at February 2015. Ryan, did you have kids at that moment? I did. I How old kids. were the kids? Uh, at that moment, it would have been like six, four, and two year olds in that 2015 moment. Um, so six, four, oh, 2015. When you stepped away, though, did, you had kids as well. Yep. Also, yeah, yeah. like five, three, one. Just, that, yep. So, so when you stepped away, you said you were looking at your bank account and it was six weeks away from being empty. Yep. Can we get, I'm going to probably break every taboo in the world here. I want to get super personal and just talk about actual numbers. How much money did you have in your savings account when you walked away? Uh, probably four or $5,000. And you walked away for a job that paid what? Uh, I'd have to look up what we paid me initially, but it was subsistence maybe. Or do you mean yeah. the open X job? The, the open X job, I'm sorry. Oh, the open X job was also not well paid. It was a hundred thousand dollars a year for somebody with okay. uh, an MBA, and like, <laughs> if, if, it feels like that wasn't valued at all. <laughs> so you had you had you had three kids, yep. and you went from being a founder with five thousand dollars in the bank to a job that paid a hundred thousand dollars. Yep. Then you decided I'm going to go back to being a founder. And I'm going to make even less than $100,000. Yes. <laughs> How do you just, just help me understand that, Ryan, because uh, it, it, let me, let me, a little bit of background. When I quit my job in growth equity, I had 30 people in finance call me and say some version of, I am so jealous of what you're doing. I wish that I could do this. I don't think I can afford it. I've got two kids. They're going to go into, they're going to go into school. I've got a wife. I want to get married. Just like some personal reason that they had in their case, golden handcuffs, like mm -hmm. they couldn't afford to get off the hamster wheel that paid them $800,000 a year or whatever the number was. In your case, you had I, close I to had, no money. I had non golden handcuffs. Um, yeah. And, uh, and, uh, was going through a divorce. And so it was like a, a very rock bottom, in all of the ways phase of my life and were you looking uh, for purpose is that what the difference was i couldn't imagine not trying to build companies as the only thing that i felt like i was good at despite all evidence to the contrary <laughs> <Aww>. <laughs> like at that point uh, there's not a lot of evidence yeah. to, to suggest that i was good at this thing but uh it felt like the only thing that i could find excitement doing and having that other job gave clarity to that it's like like this is the only thing people are going to hire me for i'd previously um been through phases where i had also had to work at jobs that were not exciting um to mm -hmm. to pay the bills i'm like it's and um yeah so it was that yolo just bet on myself and try to figure it out kind of moment and I, I guess I, I paint the picture of it. it's like it's trending to zero I knew that I could sleep on George's couch in fact there were phases when I did um, I was in George's guest bedroom for a little while um, I knew that my parents were always there so I, there was like a safety net that you wouldn't want to use but it wasn't likely that I was going to be literally on the street. Um, yeah, but, but it, you have three kids at that moment. I think that was... You have was... three kids. And so even if they had, even if you didn't have custody of them because you're going through a divorce, whatever it is, like, I can imagine that it was still hard emotionally for you to be thinking, okay, but I can still sleep on George's couch. Yeah, I mean, this is like a major element of why I ended up divorced is that um, it was not a rational thing for a father of three kids to do to, to make that choice. Um, but I couldn't imagine a life where I was happy that I hadn't made choices like that. And it was, uh, 
yeah, it was it was tough because it it's not the rational thing to do. It's not responsible. Um, I, yeah, I, I was called a deadbeat. You know, that's not a good feeling as a father. Yeah, I think this gives like a much deeper lens on how you're feeling when PayPal, when there's 40 people sitting across the table from PayPal and you're running a rocket ship company that's extraordinarily profitable. And at that phase, you're helping support your kids in an amazing way. And like, it, like life has turned around financially what, before the acquisition. And like, you're able to contribute very meaningfully in all of the ways. And so you're in a way you and honey of like, grown your confidence alongside each other, like yourselves. Like, like, I think this is something I've felt in my entrepreneurial career, which is like, my company is like this character in my life. Like we grew alongside each other. We developed our confidence together and stuff to a degree. And so, I don't know, it paints a scene for me a little bit better about like why you might not be so eager to sell even for a high price. I don't know if that resonates with you. Yeah, no, it, it absolutely does. Like basically, from the moment that things started working, um, it was incredible. And like, which is when, which is so, so we just talked about kind of a rock bottomy moment, like 2014, 20, like 2014 ish. Yeah. When do things start working from, the, the, you know, the, a little bit more financially? The crazy thing is that they started working effectively immediately after I rejoined. I could try to take all the, all the credit you, for that, I think. <laughs> the I think, day you, you join and then the revenue just, just hockey sticks. <laughs> basic, basically, we we also hired our head of partnerships at the same time, mm, which that could is, have the, is, is the real reason. <laughs> um, no, we hired uh, Chris to build our partnership, well, ultimately to build it, but first to do our partnership relationships uh, out of Santa Barbara. And he persuaded George and I that we we could probably monetize the audience that we had and understood how to, to sell it in ways that we didn't. And so this is 2015, this is 2015. So we first started getting revenue in late April, early May of 2015. Mm -hmm. And it sequentially just started months later. Yeah. Just months it, after it started doubling every month for like from there. So we had a large user install base. And so, um, when you plug in monetization to an existing audience, like it does actually start to, to make money. And so through that phase, um, it, like the crazy part, like we're sitting down in a bar in Santa Barbara with Chris at some point, And George's like, if we ever get the revenue to this amount per month, like the most crazy number he can think of, uh, we're taking the whole company to Yacht Week and, BBI, <laughs> like, um, <laughs> we hit that number like six months later. As, as in, and wow. you did not, and you did not. And, and we didn't have time to, to, to take the company to BBI. You were um, like, how about pizza day? <laughs> how about, yeah, like, Instead. we keep growing the revenue. Um, but yeah, so basically through the end of 2015, we started plugging in partnerships through affiliate marketing. Um, and then as the money started coming in, I'm like, oh, we should experiment with paid user acquisition. And in late 2015, we figured out how to market on Facebook and had payback in less than a month on paid spend. And so we just started dumping every dollar we could find into paid user acquisition on Facebook. And that worked for the next year. And then that started fizzling out and we started working other channels and like did a lot of stuff with influencer marketing and um, but basically it became paid acquisition as the growth driver and we effectively ran a growth rocket ship at cash flow neutral, um, through that whole phase. Well, Ryan, you, the, the journey you're describing is more extreme than in, in a tighter time period than most founders I've ever met, both down to. I've got $5,000 in the bank, three kids, getting a divorce to I'm um, surpassing revenue goals that I thought were insane in a really tight time frame. I would think that a lot of founders that might be in your shoes would have turned to 
something outside of work to try and keep them sane, to blow off steam. It could be meditation and working out. It could be alcohol or drugs. It could be something. How did you stay calm or level-headed? Or were you not? I mean, were you just pulling your hair out? I think in general, I'm fairly even keel as a baseline personality. Um, it's an understatement. Through the down He's phase. the calmest person I've ever met. <laughs> Just I, I feel like the 2012 to 2015 phase like gave me so much perspective on what my personal like worst case scenario feels and looks like that it's made everything else from there seem just incredible and the appreciation I have for it is like to me it feels insanely genuine of like wow this worked out better than the wildest dreams that I literally wrote down from the financial part. Um, and so that's, that's been um, incredible. Um, I run as like a, I, I run without any audio input and like people, people listen to podcasts or stuff like that. For me, running is the meditative escape where brain can wander, not be distracted by the internet or any other stimulus. And so for me that through all these phases has been like something I do as a thing for me. Um, and yeah, and I just, I I think I've been lucky to have a partner, um, in George and then in Jesse, uh, to, to share this life experience with somebody that understands it and ex- understands me and it, I'd say is equally capable of dealing with uncertainty in life. There's a lot of people that I think uh, deal with challenges in ways that are more counterproductive to themselves. And I think George is like, he, he's as level-headed of a guy as you'll meet. And I think Jesse is pretty incredible as well. Thank you. Uh, Double clicking on George. I do think that your co-founder relationship is pretty unique. I guess unique is a blanket word that could be used for many relationships, but you mentioned how you two are, were fairly interchangeable in investor conversations. Um, You both at different times in the company held the CEO role, although George for much longer and through the acquisition. Uh, But, but some of these things of just like how you would that load balance between each other fluidly, I find to be pretty unique. Like in my co-founder relationship, we had more delineated roles and it was like Stefan does certain things, I do certain things at Lumi. Um, I found that to be more of a normal pattern. Uh, So maybe you could speak to some of how you load balance between each other and also the personal dynamic. Like you somehow, I feel, managed to be true friends and especially George, I believe was a really true friend, like truly, you knowing that he he is how his couch was something you could crash on. Like he was really there for you, like as a rock through some of your darkest moments, to be honest. And he was an effective co-founder to you. I I just find that very unique, how you guys balanced all of those roles, like break it down for us more. Like how did that work? (laughs) Yeah, I'd say on the business and work side, um, I think we're both capable of doing a lot of different things. We're kind of generalists who like to then operate generally from a very first principle, get to get to the floor of why things are how they are. And so we share a philosophy on how to approach all of the different disciplines. I think because of that, I ended up with a massive amount of respect for his product and um, human psychology decision making and for or human psychology informing product decision making where I trusted him as the ultimate decider for product choices for the company um, Mm -hmm. pretty early on and explicitly gave him those keys. That didn't mean I didn't tell him all of what I thought and how we should build things and had lots of ideas and I'd do it. But ultimately I knew it was important for the organization to have one person um, responsible for that sort of thing. Otherwise you just have people. That was while you were CEO, Ryan? I was, I was the original CEO, so I built the original product, 
George was yep. right there with me. The two of us are on the patent together. Um, but I was the original CEO, and it was when I stepped down to take the other job that we're like, you can't okay. have the CEO. <laughs> it was bad enough that you had a co-founder leave. You can't have the CEO not in the meeting raising money. Yeah. Um, so George became CEO then, and then he held that title for the rest of the time. I arbitrarily held either all of the titles or no, none of the titles. I kind of rejected any other title besides co-founder because in a lot of ways, my role was filling in whatever our biggest area of need at that moment was. So there were points in time when I ran the growth marketing as we ramped that up. And then ultimately we hire somebody else full time to do that job, hopefully better than I was doing it. Um, and so a, a lot of the different roles in the company, I bounced through mm-hmm. until we built up internal expertise on it. If there were one delineation of like just general responsibility, George would lean more towards the product and managing the teams around that especially. And I touched all of the legal and finance sorts of things. Um, but that was, I think we either of us could have done either of those things as more just a specialization line. And then, like I said, when it came to fundraising, we both were out there meeting with people and actually, <laughs> at, I think our pitches were literally interchangeable where we would be saying exactly the same thing. We spent so much time together, um, especially late night dinners and sushi and talking about the vision for the company that the way we talked about it became like very, very similar. And I think uh, ultimately very interchangeable and aligned so that as we scaled the company, there was a lot of clarity to the employees on what we're trying to do because it was the same for both of us. Someone who's listening to this podcast is thinking about starting a company. They're thinking about what they want in a co-founder. What did you find was so special about your relationship with George that you think you could teach someone to look for in a co-founder? That's that's a tricky one. I think it's like a might be different for every person what the balance that works the best with them is kind of like a in a romantic relationship probably similar for george and i I think it was a lot of alignment of way we thought about approaching the world and thinking about things from a first principled point of view Um, i think that combined with a preference to go deep in relationships versus wide um, this is actually how we met in the first place. We were at a networking uh, event at Caltech at 8 a.m. in the morning on a Saturday. So imagine Caltech, 8 a.m. Saturday. Filter. We didn't know anybody, and because of that, we were both just lingering next to the the coffee and bagels or whatever they had. And like the approach was that we both just wanted to connect with people that we thought were interesting in a deep way and not just like how many business cards can I collect and meet as many people as possible. And so I think that approach to life kind of is how we, we both have operated. And I think, I think that helped initially set this, set it in motion. And then ultimately it was just a lot of time, especially as I went through the most challenging point in my life, I think fortified that. And he was, um, I was rock solid through that. And I can imagine a lot of other people would have vocalized, I don't know the extent to to which he had it, but vocalized their frustration that their co-founder was the reason that they couldn't make this thing work. Like, and and using it as an excuse for the lack of the thing working out how he hoped. Um, And so he never did that. He never made me feel bad for having to, to go work at another company for dealing with my own things on a timeline that worked for me. And so I think that set a foundation of trust and understanding that I think as the company grew, it was that same baseline, but with more fun problems to deal with instead of just the -hmm. grind. Did you continue to vest while you were away from the company? Was there any tension yeah, in, about in, that? In, in, in fact, uh, when we set up the company, we didn't even have vesting. Uh, we just owned the shares outright. So there wasn't okay. even a vesting okay. schedule for it. Um, yeah. Okay. But there was no, but to your point about how magnanimous he was about 
just the intense process in your life where you had this need and you had to do your job, et cetera. He, he never tried to implement a penalty for that, whether it's verbal or even structural with the company. No. Yeah. No. Um, I'd like to go forward a bit in time to when Honey ends up with some more people involved. So, you know, we're talking about some early days. I don't know how many people are at the company in 2015. That's actually interesting. Like maybe 30 or 50 or, or something. I, no, no, no. Okay. Sorry. I'm, wait, I'm wait, you tell me. Or you tell me 2015 uh, would be about. Uh, yeah, as we're starting to do things, I'd say there may be 10 people in varying levels of contractor and part-time. Okay. And okay, cause that's, cause that's right. Intern, that's still like right before capacity. that economic engine is really starting to click. And so it's three years after the company started, but there's still just a ragtag group for lack of a yep. better term, kind of working to build this. So, so, so just putting people in perspective of like three years after starting, it's like that, like 10 people, a lot of them contractors. Like I remember <laughs> some other jokes about like your health insurance plan being like a gummy vitamins and <laughs> yes. like in the office. So, so just kind of setting a tone. <laughs> Just kind of setting a tone. And then, and then though, uh, at, let's say, uh, I mean, again, orienting us in time, like 2018, going into 2019, the company is hundreds of people. Um, you, Honey ends up growing. Uh, you mentioned the paid Facebook stuff you were doing, but you end up going very deep on influencer marketing. Um, and I, I kind of want to illuminate a different phase of crisis handling uh, from we just covered a lot of formation and like just the grind component. But after the economic part starts working, the company is making money. Uh, crisis does not just drift away, <laughs> unfortunately. Like money flowing does not make crisis drift away. Uh, uh, top of mind is some of the uh, employee um, things you may have run into around some of your influencer marketing. I'd love to cover that. But also anything else where, you, where it would help illuminate like just because a company starts having profitability within reach, et cetera, does not mean that crisis is uh, not at your door. So um, give us a couple tidbits of like what you start experiencing and, and managing during that phase where objectively the company is working. Yeah, I mean, at some point the, the, the project that you're working on shifts from building the product and that's how we kind of reached that product market fit once we figured out the monetization side of it. We had the growth engine side of it figured out. It really became about building the, the company as the product for George and I. And so you shift a lot of attention onto organization design, people issues, and how to uh, manage uh, through that growth and make sure everybody stays aligned on the same page of what, what you're trying to do. So a lot more of the focus becomes about internal communications and uh, uh, and frankly, hiring, but more importantly, uh, firing people. Um, <laughs> might, it might sound a little cold hearted, but I think actually this is one of the things a lot of companies will admit that they don't do as well at as they, they could um, effectively a startup most of the time a lot of a high percentage of the people are doing jobs that they have never done before that no one would ever hire them to do because they don't have that experience and there's a lot of on the fly learning and so the people that thrive in that environment are different than people that thrive in a different sort of uh, corporate culture environment but one of the biggest things that every single one of those people especially in, in I'd say in Los Angeles, especially at that time, we were hiring people that did not have experience in those roles, but in particular, managing other people. Mm -hmm. So one of the biggest learnings that George and I, it, as individuals who also had never managed large teams before, had to realize for ourselves is that um, firing people is one of the hardest decisions any manager ever has to make. It's some combination of admitting you were wrong because you probably hired them, um, admitting that you were a failure because you didn't coach them into successful output, and then dealing with a generally uncomfortable um, communication with somebody about one of the most important elements of their life. And so 
for me, I, I think I internalized that based on, <laughs> based on my own personal professional experience, I realized that I was in many of the jobs that I'd had not a good fit like the tech company that I was the product manager at. Um, I was objectively not a good product manager for them because I was focused on other things. I, was, I wanted mm -hmm. still my energy and my head was still on making money successful, not on making better ad detection systems or whatever the projects were. Um, and so I learned that George actually learned that later than me um, in, in many cases, just as a fun aside, George had attempted to fire somebody and they persuaded him that maybe they should get another try. <laughs> and just the phrase attempted to fire is- Attempted to fire. And so I had start up-y. <laughs> I had to come in for the cleanup. <laughs> um, and this is not just one case of this. And so um, anyway, it's, it's a lighthearted way of talking about a hard issue, which is that then as we're battlefield promoting all of our great individual contributors who are clearly really smart, capable people who are good at this, that now you're managing a team, um, the last thing that they're going to do is want to fire somebody on their team for all the same mm -hmm. reasons that it was hard for us. And then mm -hmm. additionally, now they think this reflects on them as a manager. And so mm -hmm. one, and they want to be a manager because that's the next step in career ladders. And so one of the things that they do is go hero mode and start covering for everybody's failures on mm -hmm. their team. And mm -hmm. especially in engineering where that's like possible, they just jump in and bug fix everything and they're doing all the releases. And so we had, to teach people that it's okay to identify people that maybe would be a fit for a different job somewhere else and help them build the process around that. So I think one of the things that I spent a lot of time focusing on was that part of the education because mm -hmm. either the company would have to get to 100% efficacy on hiring or if you don't, it's, like, it's safe to assume that you don't hire 100% the right people for the right job, especially in a company where this, the size of the company was doubling, literally doubling every year. Yep. And so somebody that would have been a good fit a year ago might not be a great fit now or mm -hmm. certainly trending toward not being a good fit like a year from now just because the, the work environment is changing so rapidly. And so um, helping people learn how to, to approach that was a piece of what we're doing in the team building. Um, so that, that, that'd be kind of like just a that, non-crisis like version the... of it. Crisis version gets more towards some of our um, more controversial marketing is one that comes to mind or controversial to some people. I think the world post uh, Trump election mm -hmm. started to, or maybe continued to fragment into different worldviews. And at Honey, we built a product that I, I, th I thought, and I think is for everybody. It doesn't matter how much money you have, um, like you want to this save is a great product online. for wealthy people. Yeah, this is, yeah, it's a universal value proposition. Um, in our marketing efforts, we would had various points in time where people wanted to do personas and like, who is the honey shopper? And like, honey shopper is everybody. Throw that work in the garbage. I don't want to see it is uh, a thing that I told various marketing people several times because that's one of the best practices in marketing is to come up with these personas. Um, <laughs> but that's a setup for in our marketing efforts, we were trying to reach all sorts of different people through whatever channels were effective to reach them and communicate to them. And especially as we started working with influencers, you start running into influencers with their own brands, their own potential problems, um, but their own audiences and ways of speaking with them. And one particular case that blew up on us a little more high profilely, um, a little bit external, but also internal is we sponsored a video with uh, PewDiePie where I think he got to his hundred millionth YouTube subscriber or something like that. It's just wild, which is just, 100, that's a 100 wild million. platform for an individual to have a hundred million subscribers. And yeah. YouTube gives him a plaque and like, you've got a hundred million, I think first or second person ever to do that or something like that. I don't follow the, those battles as closely as others, but, um, in the past, he'd been associated with some anti-Semitic 
anti-Semitic comments in some of his live streaming videos, I guess. I don't, I don't, again, I'm not a, I'm not one of those hundred million subscribers, so I don't know the details of it. Um, but there was some concern in our marketing team that we'd be associating ourselves with somebody that had in the past made anti-Semitic comments. And um, there was discussion about whether or not we should do that campaign or not. And ultimately decided that yes, we would. Um, I personally didn't believe there's a hundred million racists out there and that they're not following PewDiePie for his racist content. Mm -hmm. um, and so we decided we'd do that. One of the conditions of the, um, of the marketing spend was that he was going to donate, I believe $50,000 to the Anti-Defamation League. It's like, uh, charity and, and this is fifty thousand uh, dollars of honeys like so it's of, sort of, of our money just to pause for a sec in your mind as if like in your role honey at the time do you feel like this is is this like kind of being proposed by your marketing team to soothe themselves like i'm just kind of curious if you kind of remember how it felt at the time yeah, it was definitely internal. Not concerns. that it's not a good idea. Just to be very, yeah. just to be very clear with the audience, not that it's not a good idea <laughs> to donate fifty k to this group, but just kind of how it how it was motivated internally. It was uh, a conversation. Some people wanted to do it no matter what because they thought it was going to be an effective way to reach a hundred million people at this sure. moment in time. There were other people on the team who had concerns about how it would be perceived, um, either, and, and they probably shared those concerns personally. And so the charitable donation was the compromised Sells. approach to, yeah. to do it, um, yeah. which there's probably a lot of learning to unpack and, and how this played out. Cause the next step is we launched this video and uh, some elements of PewDiePie's audience is offended that he would be donating to the ADL. <laughs> Because so we can imagine out of hundred element out of a hundred million people, I said I don't believe they're all racist, but there's probably but a some few that are. Of them are. <laughs> yeah. And so oh they goodness. they start giving him a very hard time online, and uh, and so then the next day he publishes another video where he retracts the donation to ADL. Oh. Wow. So honey, so honey is associated. The, the beauty of how, like the beauty, and by beauty I just mean sheer horror of how this plays out is yeah. is a little comical. Where like you do this thing, you come up with this approach to have it like have there be a salve on like oh, okay, this person has sort of mended their ways. There's going to be 50k to this group, yada yada. And then the person who now has publicly been associated with honey comes back online to be like. You, you know, my racist faction of fans is correct. I'm retracting. Yeah. <laughs> so Ryan, how did you feel of it? How did you feel, Ryan, in that moment? Uh, that we were in a sticky mess. I mean, it was like yeah. clearly not playing out how you draw it up in the, uh, in the marketing room. Like the sad, the overarching... disappointed, ashamed, uh, frustrated, I mean, angry, a little bit concerned, like from a, a brand point of view and then i guess the other piece is then internally it started a lot of employees having issues it's like we were unhappy yesterday that we did this we're really unhappy today because he just proved that he's <laughs> who we told you he was um and so aren't you frustrated with pewdiepie like aren't you also kind of like bro <laughs> like i mean you know I, i'm sure you don't reach out and just say that but it, uh, it's like you're it's frustrating i feel like person. i feel like he made different brand choices than i would have made for him or advised him to do but um yeah. i mean it's, that's Obviously. the wild card that you get with online creators that are individual yeah. personalities is that um yeah that's, you're gonna get a mixed bag and i, I think for me i mean it was it entered crisis comms, figure out how we're going to handle the situation because it, it spilled over into the press um, a bit. And... and did you personally address it? Like, do you at that point, are you delegating to some comms person or did you personally address the team? First, the marketing team talked about it and then I jumped in. We had a, I think we had an all hands already scheduled. And so it was obviously the topic of conversation. Uh, the marketing team talked about it, it was fielding questions and, um, it became clear that I needed to step in and let people understand what the company's position was on working with 
influencers and through channels that they don't agree with. I think that's, to me, that was the biggest thing overall in thinking about the approach is that this represented just one example of a sort of content that a segment of the population in the company or in the world wouldn't agree with. Um, we had previously sponsored things like uh, that were very left-leaning and there were not issues on that. We would sponsored an assortment of uh, right-leaning things that periodically journalists would flag as, hey, how come there's honey ads on? I, I'm making this up. I don't even know if there's a real one, but Breitbart or some of the mm -hmm. more toward the right side of uh, the media spectrum. And we've been clear that hey, we're reaching all people, lots of different places through lots of different voices. And part of what works about influencer marketing is that they're speaking to their audience in their voice, um, which is important for our product because one of the biggest hurdles that we had to getting people to sign up for this product is that it's basically free money. And so it's the value proposition is almost too good to be true. And so, mm -hmm by leaning into credibility, whether that's LA Clippers or uh, Mr. Beast mm -hmm. or people like that, we were translating some of that brand authority that those channels had to speaking to a specific audience. And that's why it worked so well for us. Um, yeah. So anyway, the, the employee backlash was actually bigger than the external backlash. And we actually had at least one uh, person resign as a result of that. And mm -hmm. I respect that choice um, completely, and uh, but at the end of the day, getting into potentially, it obviously blew up. If we knew it was going to work out that way, but um, honey is and was a, a product for everybody, and. That, that happens sometimes, I guess, is my takeaway from it. But it was definitely a, yeah. a, a, the gauntlet of internal comms, especially. Ryan, um, just kind of from bringing us through the intensity of just a massive acquisition to the origin and how unclear success, something that ends up successful can be for not weeks or months, but years. Uh, to how even when it's working, there's lots to deal with every day. Uh, just thank you for all of that. And it's just really a pleasure to have you on. Thank you. Thank you. Turpentine is a network of podcasts, newsletters, and more covering tech, business, and culture, all from the perspective of industry insiders and experts. We're the network behind the show you're listening to right now. At Turpentine, we're building the first media outlet for tech people by tech people. We have a slate of hit shows across a range of topics and industries, from AI with Cognitive Revolution to Econ 102 with Noah Smith. Our other shows drive the conversation in tech with the most interesting thinkers, founders, and investors, like Moment of Zen and my show Upstream. We're looking for industry-leading hosts and shows along with sponsors. If you think that might be you or your company, email me at eric at turpentine.co. That's E-R-I-K at turpentine.co.